Welcome to The Baton, a John Williams musical journey. Join host Jeff Cummings as he takes you through the career of the illustrious film composer John Williams, starting with his debut in 1959 through more than 100 films in 60 years. This episode features the music from the 1992 film Far and Away. Now, here's your host, Jeff Cummings. Ron Howard had worked with a few great film composers in his early years as a director. James Horner had been his composer of choice early on, but Howard also brought on Hans Zimmer and Thomas Newman for some of his movies of 4 1992. Now, who would he hire when it was time to find a composer who would write music to fit the mood of his upcoming film about Irish settlers in the United States? That composer, luckily for us, was John Williams who was just finishing up an intense 1991 and was considering scaling back on film scores to concentrate on music for the concert hall. But Williams had been longing to work on a picture such as the one Ron Howard was making, so he was willing to put his plans aside for this epic motion picture. Far and Away is a film that has a lot of admirers and a lot of detractors. Joining me today on the show is one of the movie's biggest admirers, And I am so happy to welcome Colin Stokes to the baton. Colin, it's great to have you here today. Hi, Jeff. Big fan. Uh, Give us a little background about yourself. Sure. I'm uh, I'm mainly a dad. I've got two kids, and I'm a big movie buff. I live in the Boston area, and I write and I speak about stories, the stories that we care about most, especially the blockbuster movies. I'm really interested in the ways that movies convey messages about things like gender and race and heroism. And as a parent, I'm really interested in ways to talk about movies with kids, because I think they develop critical thinking, and they can open our minds to new ideas that can be empowering. And the other thing to know about me is that I used to be a musical theater actor. So for me, stories have always been intertwined with music. And as far as John Williams is concerned, I will never forget the moment that I put my cassette tape of The Empire Strikes Back soundtrack into my Walkman in middle school, and you guys can can Google cassette tape and Walkman, uh, if you don't know what those are, and um, I was just walking down the hall in my, high, my uh, middle school, and everything was, like, super suspenseful. I think it was the Hoth attack, and it was like every locker contained an AT-AT walker. I was um, completely hooked. I pretty much wanted to have film scores playing in the background of my life ever since. A little more about uh, Colin that he didn't mention is that he's a public speaker, and I want to invite all of you to watch Colin's TEDx talk on how movies make an impression on young girls and boys. It's really good. You can find that one and others on NewHeroJourney.com. Appreciate the plug. Absolutely. So, Colin, I would imagine that being a Bostonian is a part of your appreciation of Far and Away, since a large part of the movie takes place there. So, what else about this movie appeals to you? Well, it's probably more the Irish part. Um, I've got Irish ancestors. I've been there a couple times. But Boston is also a key part. And I just have a soft spot for the movie in general. I think it's underrated. I remember seeing it with my then girlfriend, now my wife. Um, And as I look back on it now, I think it's people thought they were going to see something more naturalistic and adult. And it's really a kid's fairy tale. And for me, it's one of the really small number of movies that are like romantic movies in which the leads are really equals. Um, And they're equally attracted to each other, they're equally challenged by each other. And I love that. And I I have to kind of put put blinders on about the ideas that the movie has about the American dream and the history of immigration and westward expansion. I, I now know too much, and those are pretty much clearly based on racist propaganda. But, you know, we, we watch old movies and we try to remember the, the, the roles that they played at the time, and we can teach our children some of the real history. As far as the music goes, though, um, Far and Away is one of my favorites because it's, it's just such an example of musical storytelling. It could almost be a musical and when I listen to the, the Far and Away CD, it reminds me of a Broadway cast album. It doesn't have lyrics, but it's got all these melodies and the instrumentation changes with each location and with each major character. My whole family likes to put on the end credits because it's kind of like an overture. It's very singable. And I really feel a connection between 
John Williams music and the Broadway composers, the, the great um, show tune albums that tell a story with the songs and the songs come back and in, in reprises. And as I've listened to the baton, I've really noticed how often a theme is structured the way a song is. And we just learned about Hook, which had things that were turned into songs. And I just love the way they often have kind of an intro and a verse and a chorus and a bridge. And um, the more of these scores I listen to, the more it feels like each one is a sort of set of tunes. It's got ballads, it's got up tempos, some solos, some duets, some showstoppers. Uh, and that Far and Away certainly has a lot of those. So yeah, his use of leitmotifs and his scores definitely bring that musical feel to his music. And you don't often need to have the visuals to know the story is telling, like he does with Far and Away and like he did with Hook, which, as I said, is really was designed as a musical and still feels like it. And a lot of people will agree that the score to Far and Away is a major asset for the film. But then on the opposite side of that coin, there is the casting of Tom Cruise, which many thought to be a terrible choice. And I kind of agree with that because <laughs> I could not shake the fact that I was watching Tom Cruise do an Irish accent. And when I watched him while born on the 4th of July, for example, I saw nothing except Ron Kovic, the war veteran. Yeah, yeah. I, I, all I'll say is this movie probably would have been better with Irish actors. You can, you know, Tom Cruise, bless his heart. He, he works so hard, uh, but you can see him working. And, uh, the accent looks like he's concentrating on it. You know, the character, he gets better as he goes along, as he becomes more of a kind of, um, you know, action hero, uh, physical guy. But at the beginning, when he's supposed to be awkward, it's awkward. Um, but boy, nobody can do determined like uh, Tom Cruise. The the man can clench his jaw like nobody else. <laughs> yeah, he clenched his jaw pretty much through ninety percent of Top Gun. <laughs> Uh, so I've been trying to think of well-known Irish actors at the time in 1991, but all of them were too old for the role. People like Liam Neeson and Brendan Gleeson and so on. And then there's Colin Farrell, who's probably one of the best Irish actors right now, but he was only 15 years old when Far and Away was filmed, so he was too young. So there weren't many choices available at the time, unfortunately. Uh. You know, Liam Neeson would have been so perfect. It's uh, if if it had just made a little been made a little earlier. He's got that you know, tough uh, tough Irish brogue. Yeah, he would have been perfect if the movie were made in the nineteen seventies. <laughs> uh, but you have to remember, at this time, he was getting ready to make his mark with Schindler's List uh, just the next year. But remember, he will get his Irish movie when he makes Rob Roy in nineteen ninety five. So That's not true. all That's all true. is not lost. Oh well. So let's go back to Tom Cruise and Far and Away. And what you might know is not know is that he was not considered for the movie in the early stages of casting. And Nicole Kidman, who was already making heads turn with her breakout roles in movies like Dead Calm and Days of Thunder, was an early choice to play Shannon, who was a forward-thinking Irish woman who dreams of owning land in Oklahoma. And it was actually Nicole Kidman who convinced Cruise to consider the role of Joseph Donnelly. At the time, Cruz and Kidman were dating, and I think Cruz was so in love that he wanted to do another movie with Kidman after they had worked on Days of Thunder in 1990. So I've read some conspiracy theories, you know, the internet is full of them, that Cruz threatened to walk out of the picture if Kidman wasn't hired, but it's not true, because Kidman was the one who suggested Cruz. Now, after Kidman and Cruz married in December 1990, Ron Howard has been quoted as saying that his biggest challenge was making sure the newlyweds didn't show too much romantic chemistry in the film. And of course, this isn't the first time that a husband and wife would star in the same movie together. You'll remember that Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall pretty much made a really good career out of it. So the film itself follows Joseph and Shannon from Ireland to the United States, where they somehow are managed to room together in a Boston hotel while saving money to afford that trip to Oklahoma where there's free land for the taking. And that depiction of real life Oklahoma in that land rush scene is a big set piece of the movie and it's filmed with hundreds of extras and some really brave stuntmen. And that scene's my favorite in the movie and we have to wait two hours to get to it. And that's really my only gripe about the film, Colin, is that it spends so much time building up to the moment that's been discussed for the entire movie, 
And after it happens, the movie just ends. And I think a better movie would have come from showing Joseph and Shannon dealing with their new life together in Oklahoma and how they managed to use the land. Most of these scenes in Boston could have been taken out. Now, I'm sure the ladies liked seeing sweaty and shirtless Tom Cruise in the boxing scenes, but I'm not sure how it moves the story along, especially in their journey to get to Oklahoma. And the long sequence of them hiding out in a house during a harsh winter is beautifully photographed. But again, I was just anxious at that point to get to Oklahoma. Yeah, I I, I see what you're saying, Jeff, but... For me, it, it played like a quest movie where you, you set up where the characters want to get to at the beginning, and then it's sort of part of the fun is just watching them have setback after setback and um, put them you know on the street uh, with you know no food and it's snowing, and, and then when they finally arrive uh, in the big sunny Oklahoma, it's a big payoff. So I, I sort of like the, the way that he created the different color schemes and the long uh, romantic tension between the two of them. They both get to see each other getting dressed. Um, But, you know, I I basically agree with you that the ending of the movie is really where it falls apart. If it had a good ending, it would have been a much more popular movie. But at least we did have John Williams' score to elevate the proceedings as it always does. That's for sure. So as I mentioned earlier, Williams had been looking for a project of this type for many years, and he was very happy to be offered the opportunity. And in the liner notes for the first CD release of the score, John Williams wrote, quote, After seeing John Ford's classic film The Quiet Man as a youngster many years ago, I had always aspired to write a film score based on an Irish subject. When Ron Howard asked me to score his film Far and Away, I immediately realized that my opportunity had arrived. End quote. So I just want to note that Victor Young's score to The Quiet Man is good, but it wasn't one of the seven Oscar nominations that the movie received. But there aren't many films that have that epic feel and are set in Ireland, and you have to go back to something like Ryan's Daughter or How Green Was My Valley. Um, and both of them are very good films. Yeah, you know, and I was reading about the origin of the film too, and I think it's interesting that music was, was one of the triggers for the whole project. Uh, Ron Howard, the story goes, saw the folk band from Ireland, the Chieftains, in concert long before the movie, and he loved it, the, the music so much, and he started thinking about doing an Irish story inspired by his grandfather's you know, recollections about the land rush. The movie was called The Irish Story until pretty late in the game. And then when it came time to do the movie, John Williams knew the Chieftains too, because he had had them do guest appearances at the Boston Pops. So Everybody was really on the same page about the musical approach to this story. And um, you can tell right away, because right at the opening credits, that Irish sound is established. You can hear the chieftains. Their leader, Paddy Maloney, is playing a sort of free-form air on this uh, distinctive Irish instrument, the penny whistle, over a drone that sounds a little bit like a bagpipe. And then you hear this um, trademark Irish instrument, the Yulian Pipe. And it plays this minor key theme uh, while the camera is flying backward over the ocean towards the rocky coast of County Galway. And um, the first part of this tune is going to be heard over and over again in the movie, kind of as a stand-in for Ireland. Once we see the land beneath us, we hear what will turn out to be the main theme of the movie. It's first performed with a pan flute, and we're going to hear this theme many, many times in a lot of different ways. And this first time, it's very gentle and pastoral.
So I remember being in the theater and I had this weird sense of deja vu when I heard this cue. And I don't know if anybody else will know this. I'm probably the only one. But the tune is very similar to a song in the cartoon movie of The Hobbit, which came out in 1977, which I grew up on and I absolutely loved. See if you can hear it. Okay, just me? Well, maybe so. No, no, I hear it too, Colin. I don't think you're too far off. And I think The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings movies themselves kind of always have had this Irish sensibility to me, so... I think it has its roots in Ireland, so having that sound kind of makes sense. Anyway, um, after that opening, there's a scene that's a confrontation between the bad guys, the landlord's men, and the good guys, the tenant farmers. And that scene ends with an old man being uh, crushed. So it's a bit jarring to go from that scene to the music you're about to hear, which is kind of goofy. Um, it's a, it's more chieftains and it's a kind of slapstick introduction to Tom Cruise's character, Joseph Donnelly. He's wrestling with a donkey and, um, then there's some unintentional comedy of his accent, but the music is perfect. It's a, it's a pastiche of an Irish folk tune and it's performed with this kind of sloppiness that, um, just really feels like they're almost on the set playing it. And I want you to listen to this tune and remember it, the first tune, because it's going to reappear in the third act in a really different form. Halfway through the scene, there's a different tune that comes in, also played by the Chieftains. It's also kind of goofy. And for me, Williams is telling us that even though these men are wrestling with each other and punching each other, nobody is getting hurt. So this whole track is called The Fighting Donnellys. It's a real delight. And um, we're going to hear some of it again when Joe is using these boxing skills to get ahead in America. So I said those scenes in Boston aren't really my favorite and they don't really seem to move the plot forward. 
but the boxing scenes are really cool and I love them so much, especially because the music is so good. So I'm looking forward to talking about those later. Totally. All right. So that old man that was wounded in the opening turns out to be the Donnelly brothers dad. And so there's this death scene and we get this um, device of the camera floating upward and spinning. The strings play a very pretty set of chords. They're, they're not very mournful. They're more magical. And you, then you'll hear the Yulian pipe and the horns come in and that trans- transitions us to uh, uh, an expression of loss, one of John Williams' beautiful, full-hearted kind of mourning cues. And this is the part where the camera seems to be floating through the ceiling and looking out at the ocean. And the music is helping with a with a great sort of cinematography trick. When we when we go through the roof and look out at the ocean, it turns out there's been a passage of time because the fun, the the funeral procession for Joe Donnelly's dad is marching along the shore already. Um, but they're about to be interrupted by the henchman of the evil landlord, Stephen Chase. Ah, uh, yes, Stephen Chase. Uh, it's Stephen who will be the main villain throughout the movie, but. I don't think in any way Thomas Gibson is a worthy adversary to Tom Cruise, not just as a, these two characters, but just as actors. I think Thomas Gibson was really trying hard, but he just never came across as someone that you thought was really evil. It could really foil any of the plans that they had. Yeah, not quite. So after Stephen burns the Donnelly home, Joe plots revenge, and he says he's going to travel to the landlord's home and kill him. And what we get is some nice travel music as Joe rides along the coastline. And I want you to be ready for the strings to play this main theme on a wonderful shot of the Irish countryside. Thank you. 
So after Joseph meets Shannon, and after Joseph Gunn misfires and knocks him unconscious, and after Joseph tries to, in his weakened state, to fight Stephen, Stephen challenges Joseph to a duel. And I just have to say that I'm a big fan of the music, musical Hamilton. I've seen it twice. So when I was watching the duel scene, I couldn't help but imagine that song, The Ten Duel Commandments, which is one of my favorite moments of the musical, and how the scene in Far Away pales greatly in comparison to what is in Hamilton. But, as he always does, John Williams does very well to bring in some tension to the prelude to the duel with the basses playing so ominously under those solemn bagpipes as they choose their weapons. And the great thing about the duel in Far and Away is that no shots are fired, but that's because it's so foggy that morning that no one could see anything. Now, Shannon comes in kind of as a deus ex machina on a wagon, and Joseph hitches a ride as the main theme whisks them away to a boat headed to Boston, where they will pretend to be brother and sister in order to share a room. So the, the way that cue ends is probably my favorite device in the score. Um, I, don't, I don't think I know any other movies where this happens, where the orchestra comes in over the Irish band. It, it starts just feeling like it's a few intru- instruments, like, a, like source music almost, but then in perfect alignment, all these strings come in and support that same tune. It feels to me like it's a plane taking off, like we're... We're moving from the real world into a mythical version of that world. Yeah, it's a heightened version of the real world. So I want to jump ahead a little bit in the movie to my favorite musical moment in the film when Tom Cruise hears people having sex in a room above him. Now, instead of enduring the sounds, he runs out into the street sexually frustrated because 
he and Shannon haven't really reached that part of their relationship yet, and forces himself into a boxing match. And before we talk about the music from this scene, I want to say that I had never seen Far Away before watching it for this episode. And the only music I had heard from the film was a concert suite that Williams had created. And I had heard it on many, many collaboration albums. I did like the main theme performance, but it was the shirt show portion that really stood out. So I was thrilled that that part was performed as Joseph takes on a burly opponent in a boxing match. Oh, man, it, it's so much better on the album without all the crowd noises. Oh, yeah, that was my one gripe about the scene, is that it seems that the sound effects editors won the battle over whose work gets priority in the boxing scenes. Right. And that's true a bit later in a montage of scenes where we see Shannon working in a chicken plucking factory for pennies while Joseph is earning a lot as a boxer. Yeah, and I love the drums of that Chieftains Ensemble with a bit of orchestral enhancement again. They go with this these slow-motion images of Joe. Um, they look like paintings uh, as he's boxing. And then there's this magical rush when the orchestra kind of gives the chamber musicians a hug and you hear those Aaron Copeland chords. 
it's it's beautiful. Yeah, and there's something else about these boxing scenes. It's interesting that Williams didn't try and go for the obvious musical technique of creating musical sync points for all of the punches. And he does that for a few of them, but I really think that was a missed opportunity. Uh, as I said before in previous episodes, this technique of creating musical sync points is one of my favorite aspects of musical scoring, not just in comedies, but in dramas as well. And John Williams does it so well, and I think that's why he's been so successful. It's true, it's true. And this piece, um, it works so well as a kind of concert piece on its own. But you get the sense that maybe Ron Howard didn't feel it because um, he could have he could have edited it to to sync with those punches a little bit more, but instead he sort of dials it down and it, it's kind of like background music. Um, it would have been interesting to see, uh, you know, either that music allowed to just guide the editing or uh, or to have him uh, have composed something that was a little bit more timed. Um, but hey, the next piece is a cue called the Big Match. So we're still in the boxing world. And um, this is where there's uh, a new theme, a terrific little fanfare that's introduced as the big crowd is getting ready to watch Joe fight the uh, scary Italian boxer. This tune also reminded me of something, but only later, because it's very similar to to something from the musical Ragtime that didn't come out until five years later. Um, But it also, as I'm listening to it now, kind of reminds me of the one of the, the really all-time great themes that Williams wrote, the, the slow theme from Jurassic Park. It was just a, a year or so away. Something about the, the ringing, uh, like, bell-like, uh, gorgeous chords that you'll, you'll hear here. And then for the rest of this is a a nice, long, action-packed cue with a lot of emotion in it. That Irish theme is going to be heard over this uh, syncopated, low-string accompaniment. Um, Very dissonant, very pulsing. As this uh, cue continues, listen for the main theme to come in. It it sort of floats over the music, and it doesn't have the chords with it. Um, and to me, this is interesting because it's when Joe is distracted from the fight. He he sees Shannon um, on the other side of the room with this uh, city councilor who's very lecherous, and it and it throws him off. And the melody sort of floats over the action. And to me, it's like a voice in the back of their heads saying, don't forget your dream, 
but um, it's clashing with everything else that's happening. And to me, it's a nice way for John Williams to be dramatizing the tension the characters are experiencing between, you know, they're so close to achieving this this big victory, but there are um, things getting in their way. And that distraction is enough to ultimately cause Joe to lose the match. Now, of course, if Joseph had won the match, he and Shannon would have taken off to Oklahoma the next day. Probably would have been rosy and cheerful with some great music there, but there's no drama in that. So it leads them to being thrown out on the street searching for food. And that takes us from one of my favorite parts of the score to my least favorite part of the score. The twinkly glitter music of the mansion scene. Um... You know, it reminds me of the music from Jurassic Park in the with the Brontosaurus. It's like it's like a lot of frosting with no cake. It's just very sweet, um, and um, not my not my taste. But I do quite like the main theme on the piano that you're going to hear. Thank you. 
we could do a little playlist of um, John Williams on the piano. It, do, it doesn't happen that often, but it's always so gorgeous. I think of the end of JFK, the um, Jurassic Park, Schindler's List, Angela's Ashes. Um, here, he puts a little bit too much reverb on it for me. And there's that Julian pipe coming in in counterpoint. And then on screen, they're silhouetted with this blue light in the snow falling through the window. It's a, it's a bit much. I agree 100%. This is one of my least favorite scenes as well. This was one where I was really getting itchy to just get us to Oklahoma because it just wasn't moving. At least the boxing scenes were moving things along and everything. A lot of the other stuff in Boston was moving things along, but this just screeched everything to a halt to get us to start to feel that they're starting to fall in love with each other. But it just, it was too much. I like your analogy, too much frosting, no cake. But I suppose we had to set up this event because... We have to get Joseph and Shannon to separate. And that happens when the owners of the mansion come back. And Shannon and Joseph are trying to escape. But while they do, Shannon is shot in the back. Now her parents, as well as Steve and Chase, have come to Boston to find her. And so Joseph takes Shannon to their home and then runs away to a new life laying railroad tracks in Missouri. So can we talk about the, the music after Shannon is shot? It's not like um, a classic standalone cue, but I, I think it's a good example of John Williams being a, a musical dramatist. Yes, by all means, all right. please do. So Joe is carrying Shannon through the snow, and you hear a few desperate phrases from that main theme. When we get to Stephen's apartment, the twinkles come back very softly, um, but they're a little more dissonant.
And then as he decides that he's going to leave her there, listen for the main theme coming in slowly on the flute over strums of the harp, which is like the most Irish instrument there is. And then there's this heartbreaking moment where the piano is coming in to try to reprise the theme, but it, it peters out. It sounds like, like its voice is cracking. Okay, so then Joe has left Shannon with his, you know, arch rival, and he's out in the snowy night. You're going to hear the minor key Irish theme, um, and then the theme speeds up, and then it plays double time. And this is as Joe is starting to run faster and faster away from this, this uh, very painful parting. And John Williams is going to build this music up until we have a, a smash cut to this explosion in the sunny plains where um, the caption will say eight months later. Yeah, the music that's scoring that running is so good. And of course, that's John Williams knowing how to tell us what's happening in Joseph's mind without going overboard. And I love the horns that play the Irish theme. Just perfection. Just really sets up the urgency. So Joseph will eventually make his way to Oklahoma when he sees a bunch of covered wagons headed west. And he makes it to Oklahoma, and that's where he sees Shannon on the day before the big land race. And here's another cue that to me feels very musical theater. It's like the characters are singing sections of songs that they've sung earlier in the show, but now in a sort of different mood, it's more rueful. So you hear the, the Irish theme, it's quiet, it's sort of resigned, like even though we're together, we're, you know, we're now, you're now with somebody else. And then you hear the main theme and it's just strings and it comes out to me, it's like the sun coming out, it's so pretty. And it plays all the way to the end of the melody. A lot of times John Williams will just give you the first phrase and then stop. And when he decides to play something all the way through, it's very deliberate. And here, to me, it signals that whatever happens, even though they're not together, they have reached a kind of mutual respect, a stable place in their relationship.
And you know, the more I hear this theme, the more it sounds like a real Irish song, like like How Are Things in Glockamora? And I, I cannot um, keep from making up lyrics. You know, I still remember Shannon Christie, those Irish pipes are singing as I kissed ye. Something like that. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love it. Yeah, I've put lyrics to a lot of his well-known melodies, particularly a lot of those uh, melodies for The Empire Strikes Back. I, I actually, at one point, I thought about writing a song that kind of uh, went with Han and Leia's love theme, but I could never really complete it. But uh, yeah, I would, I could see it. Totally I, could see that. I think you're going to have to drop that as a bonus podcast, uh, Jeff. Ooh, yeah. And maybe I'll have you in to sing it. <laughs> So, I I really like those lyrics because it really does say in music what Shannon and Joseph just can't seem to say in this scene. I could see them trying to say, I love you, I want to be with you, but I can't. And so, John Williams does it for them. That's but, well put. Yeah, at least they've reached a new level in their relationship, and they're going to need it with, for this big race. And this sequence feels like something John Ford or David Lean might have directed in the 1950s, but it's really Ron Howard showing us that he could do something on a really big scale, and he hasn't really done something like this ever in his movies. So, like I said, the wind kind of falls out of the sails for this sequence because, at least for me, I've been waiting so long for it that I've, I think I've just been exhausted waiting for it and anticipating it. Well, for me, it's worth the wait. Um... It's just an old-fashioned kind of dazzle your socks off. I can't believe they actually filmed this sequence today. It would, it would all be digital. So um, so that's also particularly impressive. And, you know, the cue that John Williams comes up with is an absolute classic as well. So it starts with the sun coming up on the day of the race, and strings are setting the scene. We see hundreds of horses and covered wagons lining up on the plains under a blue sky. Once that gun fires, we get a fantastic brass fanfare for the start. Copeland intervals and rhythms. They're coming in as we see Joe struggling to ride his unbroken horse. And then the main theme is going to weave in and out as Joseph and Shannon continue to ride in the race.
So before we go on, I want to remark on that fanfare that played at the start of the race, that big brass fanfare. Now, Williams was so enamored with it that he lifted it directly from the far and away score and used it for part of his six movement American Journey composition in 2000. So you'll hear the lead up to it and then you'll hear exactly, almost note for note, this brass fanfare. And that is part of the opening movement of American Journey called Immigration and Building. So it's very fitting that the music from far and away, particularly the music for the land race, was used for this piece. So now we're at the final showcase action cue of the movie. It starts with a uh, pulsing triplet rhythm on cellos. And then it bursts into another huge fanfare. And this wonderful optimistic theme plays on the French horn. And I don't know why it took me so long to realize it, but it's... The same tune that we heard at the very top of the film when Joe Donnelly was farming. So it's like Joe's story has gone from just these few wooden instruments playing sloppily while he's struggling with a donkey to this moment, this rousing orchestra and a cast of thousands. And then for the rest of the cue, you've got the main theme, you've got bits of the Chieftain's tunes, some Elmer Bernstein-style Western scoring. It's really clear that John Williams was inspired by the sweeping scope of this uh, really spectacular piece of movie making. And then Joseph claims his land, but of course he's got to get in that final scuffle with Stephen that causes Joseph to fall off a horse, get trampled, and hit his head on a rock. And Joe apparently dies, but uh, there's that camera floating up, so we recognize the device and we're already a step ahead because we can anticipate that he's going to come back to life. And so John Williams obliges us with the first phrase of the main theme right at that moment.
And I really like that he uses strong beats on the timpani when Joseph Spirit comes back with the main theme stronger than ever for this rousing conclusion. So as I said before, I did really want this movie to end because I was aching to find out what happened to Joseph and Shannon after that. But I suppose everyone lives happily ever after, except for Stephen, of course, who probably couldn't find any land to take and return home to Ireland. I mean, yeah, I, I totally agree. They really seem to have made this ending up on the set. I mean, there's this evil jerk who's been twirling his mustache for the whole movie, and he literally just, like, changed his mind and walks off. It's, it's really anticlimactic. Um, and it's a shame, because for me, the, up until this point, the tone of Far and Away sort of reminds me of, like, Titanic. It's dumb, but you get swept up in all the emotion. Um, and Ron Howard is just not quite James Cameron. He doesn't know how to wring every drop of sentiment out of us, and this ending... Um, is an example. Like, think about the end of Titanic, how great it would be if, um, like you were suggesting, Jeff, like some kind of epilogue, and we we see their little house like 50 years later, and they have an all-American family, and they're celebrating Thanksgiving or something like that. I mean, it, it really would have made a huge difference. Yeah, a missed opportunity. I, I think it would have been a great way to close out the film, and imagine what John Williams would have written for that. That's right. Well, Ron Howard needs to ask us next time. <laughs> we could be his consultants. So I want to discuss something again about Tom Cruise that I had noticed after watching Far and Away. So until 2004's Collateral, no character that Tom Cruise had played before ever died before the film ends. Huh. Which, yeah, it's really interesting. So Joseph's almost death was the closest Tom Cruise got to dying on screen until Collateral. And I'm going to apologize because if you haven't seen Collateral, now you know that Tom Cruise dies. But if you haven't seen the movie, you really should. It is excellent. It's got a great score and soundtrack, too, by James Newton Howard. Yeah, so that's just an interesting fact I want to share. It seemed like Tom Cruise just went through 26 films without dying before he finally got that on-screen death. Yeah, and now his career is basically just get beat up and thrown around and do absurd stunts, but not die. (laughs) He really does get beat up. I don't know how I don't know how Tom Cruise is still walking around these days. So speaking of deaths, Far and Away didn't really die on the vine when it was put into theaters mm. on May twenty second, nineteen ninety two. Yeah. It earned almost one hundred and forty million dollars on a sixty million dollar budget. But as Tom Cruise had been doing through his career, he was able to brush off the bad press seven months later when a few good men took Hollywood by storm making twice as much money as Far and Away. And I think people who think back to 1992 don't even think about Far and Away when they think of Tom Cruise. But as for Nicole Kidman, she continued to rise as an actress. And I think her double whammy in Batman Forever and To Die For in 1995 really helped her to step out of the shadow of just being Tom Cruise's wife. And of course, after their divorce, she did win an Oscar for playing Virginia Woolf in 2003. Now, the score to Far and Away, I think, is bound in the ne- for the rest of this 2020 to experience a resurgence in interest thanks to the March release of the score by La La Land Records. Now, I don't have a copy of it, but it is great to get a lot of these scores, especially the ones that don't get much recognition via awards or box office success. 
and it's out there now for fans to hear completely. My copy's on its way. Oh, now I just I have to nerd out on one more thing that I noticed about the score. Is that okay? Yeah, please do. Okay, so listen to the four notes that start the phrases of the main theme. Da 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 da. Okay, those are the same four notes that start the jig that I was talking about that later becomes heroic. Da 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 da. And I'm not even done. They're the same four notes that start that blowing off steam sequence. Da 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 da. Da 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 stay there all sort of parts of Joe's DNA being expressed in different ways. It's it's nerding out, but I really do feel like in this period, like like in Hook, John Williams is is creating scores that are so carefully thought through, and in a lot of ways they're more carefully thought through than the movies are. Yeah, that's that's why his music makes the movies even better. Nerd out as much as you want. I really like that insight. It was really kind of cool. I mean, it's it's so disjointed, but I really like those brief moments of genius that Ron Howard put in it. I mean, the the boxing matches are really kind of fun. It gives gives something really to kind of keep the movie just not just be this talky drama movie. And then, of course, the land rush scene, just absolutely great. Uh, and I think it gave him the confidence to put together Apollo 13 three years later. Now, as for John Williams, as we said, he fulfilled his long-standing dream of making music for an Irish film. And with that out of the way, he's now going to return to very familiar territory for his next project, which is the sequel to Home Alone. And I'm going to talk about that score in the next episode. So, Colin, thanks for joining me today. It has been an absolute thrill to have you here. Oh, how I love the Johnny Williams. <laughs> yeah, somebody needs to write a love song for John Williams. It is, so, it's been just out there desperate to be done. Now, perhaps one of our listeners is going to do that. Where is Leslie Brickus when you need him? Yeah. Of course, you know, there, there, there has been a really um, successful love song for John Williams. Uh, bar was set very high by Corey Vidal. Do you remember this? Be with you. Oh. John Williams is the man. Oh yeah, I forgot about Corey. I used to, I watched that like maybe a hundred times in like two days because I loved it so much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I don't think anybody could top that, but the gauntlet has still been thrown. So I want you guys to really put your minds together and see if you can create a great love song for John Williams and Maybe submit it to the baton, and we'll put it in one of the episodes at the near the end, and maybe send it out to John Williams. That would be wonderful. So, as always, I want to hear from readers about what you think about some of the scores that we've discussed on the show, and I always encourage you to leave a review on Apple Podcast. Now, do you agree or disagree with some of the thoughts that Colin have, and I have made on this show? Um, send them along to me at jeffswim at AOL.com or post a comment on the Podbean app. I look forward to hearing from you as always, and until next time, the baton is down. The baton is down. 